Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vario, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Innovation Games, software-powered innovation through collaborative play by Luke Holman. And without further ado, we'll, we'll start the program. Uh, Luke Holman is... He's doing amazing things. He's going to tell you all about it. But if you go look at the work he's done and, and the organizations he, he's worked with, I don't think he can help but be impressed. And, and Luke's going to tell you a little bit about himself, so I won't uh, ruin the story. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. There you go. Um, uh, and it was very kind to say I'm doing amazing things, but you're going to find out that it's not I, it's we. There's a lot of people doing amazing things. And one thing I thought was interesting is I think Andrew was asserting that people in this room would have a full deck of cards. Many people who are new to Agile sometimes think we're crazy, right? So we may not have a full deck of cards. Um, this is a little bit about me. And, and the reason I throw this slide right now is uh, the, the, that six-year-old girl who is convinced she's a pirate is the reason why I wasn't able to come to the conference yesterday, because it was, dads with don it was Donuts with Dad's Day. So I wanted to be there with Josephine. So I wanted to thank Andrew for being really flexible about letting me uh, come at a time that uh, you know, was convenient for my family. And I appreciate that. Um, as you can see, um, I try to work hard, but I play at work. And we're going to talk about play and what that means and how that works. And I'm going to try and do something a little different, which is rather than talk about, has anyone read that Standish report stuff about how terrible we are? and software, how all these failures exist. Anyone read it? Boo. Say boo. Boo. Because, because I think that we should actually celebrate software-powered innovation. And, and I think we have the greatest job as software people. And I, I mean this completely sincerely. This is the magic that you create. And, and I want to I kind of pump you up a little bit about what you do around the world. Now, of course, I have a picture. And um, real briefly, if you're an innovation games trained facilitator, raise your hand. We got Dale. We got who else? There should be. Israel is here, or he was here. We got Anders. And of course, Jeff Patton is, is a trained facilitator. And, and if you know Jeff, you know he's always doing his slides up until the last minute. So last night, I was changing some slides, so I thought I should throw a picture of Jeff in there. Let's talk about software-powered innovation, software magic. Remember when this was innovative? Remember? Or am I dating myself? <laughs> but that was innovative. It was. We had that innovation with MS-DOS. And then we had more innovation. The original mouse from Engelbert in 68. And if you've never seen the video, the actual video of Engelbert doing telepresence in real time, high def bitmap displays from 68, you have no idea what we still have not yet to accomplish. Collaborative video editing in 68, right? And then that became Xerox stuff, and of course, Father Steve, and now we have the Mac, and we have the iPad. And although my wife disagrees with me, I think it was a perfectly justified reason to get Marvel Comics on my iPad to justify the iPad. <laughs> because if you read Iron Man on an iPad, it's like, oh man. It's for work, <laughs> really. <laughs> it is. OK, and now look at where we are, right? You think Tom Cruise in the movies, but there's people who are doing work with embedded systems with a company called Intuitive Surgical, which actually enables doctors to operate on patients in uh, very non-invasive ways. And you know what? You did that. Maybe not you personally, but us as the community. Because this is all lumps of metal without software. It's all lumps of metal without software. And it's not just the user interface that I'm talking about. We've had innovation, software-powered innovation, as we, as we have learned as uh, a community to solve problems about architecture and scaling. Remember when we did two-tier and we thought that was cool, and then we're like, oh, no, you're putting the business logic in the user interface. That's a no-no. So we did three-tier, and then we did four-tier, and now we have 17-tier, because that's cool. Right? One more tier, it's got to be better. And then we, we created data warehousing, 
data warehousing architectures, data warehousing pictures. Again, we're solving these amazing problems. And we came up with patterns as a way to share this stuff and communicate this. And this is all software-powered innovation, magic that you create, magic that software people create every day. It's a great profession. And it's not just at the user interface at the architecture level. If you look at the world of innovation, because I'm here to talk a little bit about innovation and collaboration and collaborative play, if you look at the world of innovation, there's many kinds of innovation in the world. There's business model innovation, and there's process innovation, and there's channel innovation, and there's distribution innovation, and there's, there's all sorts of products and services, and they are all powered by software. I know the hardware thing is important, too. I don't want to discount those hardware guys. I know he's laughing. He's like, don't show that on YouTube. <laughs> the, this is all powered by software. Business model innovation, right? Zipcar, changing the way we drive, changing the way cities engage transportation, powered through software because it's sophisticated routing and scheduling. Software people did that. You did that. Supermarkets in the 50s. The biggest supermarket had approximately 8,000 items. Why? Because that was the limit that a human could manage the inventory. That was the paper limit. Now you go in and you have 8,000 kinds of ketchup. <laughs> Some people say that's not so good if you like a lot of different variety in your ketchup or your salsas or your, you know, your pickles and your olives and stuff. And that was all done because a software person did that. Oh, back to the car. How many computers in the average luxury car? Five. Huh? Five? Five? Mm. How about like an order of magnitude more? 30 to 50. 30 to 50. How many millions of lines of software code in the average car? 10 to 20? About five. Five to 10. You know variable valve timing, which helps improve fuel economy? Right, where you start off with eight cylinders if you're pulling a heavy load, and then on the highway you've gotten the two and four. GM had that working in the 70s, but it took a VAX to run it. Moore's Law kicks in, software people get more efficient, now we have variable valve timing. Cars are safer. Materials are safer, right? We're, 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 as a society, we're, we, you are creating a better society through software. World's tallest building, elevators, won't work without software. What we do, right? So software innovation is everywhere. And when I, this is Jeffrey Moore with um, uh, one of his recent books dealing with Darwin, and he talks about all the different ways you can innovate, all the different exciting ways you can innovate. Of course, as you can imagine, given my lens, right, I just see all software. This is pretty cool. So software, I think, being in this profession, I, w I told Andrew that part of what I wanted to do in this talk was give a little bit of celebration of what we do as a profession. In independent of process, independent of agile or not agile, whatever, just what we do. And, and if you think about your world and how software affects your world, it is a way, cool a way cool profession to be in. And I give a longer version of this talk to high school kids and college kids trying to get them to join our profession, right? Because this is really cool stuff. We do really cool stuff, broad universe. Now, when you think about it, what causes and creates and enables and promotes innovation? Give me some shout outs. What, what do you think creates this notion of innovation? Need. What? Need. need. Someone said need, was that right? Need. Yeah, you've got to understand the problem. You have to understand the problem. Even if people don't, even if your customers don't know they have a problem, you can help them. That's true innovation, when you're helping them realize that they don't even have a problem when you're solving for it. What else creates this notion of innovation? Competition. competition. Two people said competition. You bet, right? One hand clapping isn't very interesting. Competition is good. Competition is good, and it does create innovation. Scarcity creates innovation. What else creates innovation? Innovative stuff. Play. Play, Alistair. I, you know, I got a little some. I know, but I do have stickers if you want them. <laughs> The only problem with my stickers is when my kids rate my stickers, like, those are Diggy's work stickers. Who's your own? Back off the stickers. It's great to get audited by the IRS for legitimate deduction. Play. Play creates innovation. Absolutely. Play creates innovation. Absolutely. 
What else creativity? The Vision. Vision, yes. What else creativity? Yes. All these things create innovation. Right? And so one of the things I want to talk about though is that we are talking about innovation. I'm not talking about invention, right? Invention is the thinking of new stuff. That's cool, but innovation is actually putting it in practice. So what I want to talk about is the role of collaborative play, not so much in the, in the, in the invention side, but in the innovation side. How can let's get this into practice? And there are people who study this, people who hardcore study this, and they're not necessarily from the software community. So one of the people who studies innovation, which we're going to talk about is the idea of putting things in practice, a common way to talk about this is what's called new product development. New, the, the, the field of new product development. And there's a guy named uh, Robert Cooper, and he has a model of new product development called Stage Now, when Stage Gate is understood, it's very compatible with Agile. When it's misunderstood, people go, oh, that's waterfall. Because they see that Bob says heavy front end homework before development begins. And they go, oh, that's big up front design. You don't do that. Right? Emerging. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, do your homework. Understand some of the need in the market, the problem that you're solving. Understand your customers before you just run off and start developing. Make sure that you get a handle on what the problem is. But look at some of the other things that Cooper has found to be drivers and supporters of this notion of innovation. Can you see the Agile Manifesto here? Parts of it, yes. Rock, what's your yes? Question for that. Huh? 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 You can give me a grind. Huh? Huh? Right? What parts of the other manifest do you see right here? Customer focus. Number one, huh? How about spiral development? Spiral development. Now this was done before we had other methods, right? And when, when the spiral development method was really, um, you know, the more prominent Agile method, very main spiral. Loops with users throughout the world. That's not kind of Agile. Metrics, accountable teams. Sounds interesting. Holistic effective cross-functional teams. Now, when Bob Cooper is saying cross-functional, he doesn't mean you know, he test with the developers. And well, you know, who want it. He means truly cross functional team. Marketing and sales and finance and distribution and manufacturing and development all working together to create a product and offering in the market. Pretty incredible stuff. Hey, Dale, did I say anything worth tweeting at? Yep. All right, right on. Tweet tag, and then games. Okay, now, if you can't remember the Agile Manifesto, here it is. We can reread that. Now, I will include all of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the 14 uh, practices, but here's the core stuff, the individuals and interactions, working software, customer collaboration. So we're going to talk about the notion of collaboration and play as it relates to this great thing that we get to do. We get to write software. We get to be innovative every day. And the world of innovations really, to me, live in software. I, I mean, I know there's other stuff. But if you think about the other stuff, like someone said the factor models today, well, you know, you know, there's a lot of innovations that occur in material science that have nothing to do with software. Like, really? I'm good with that. I said, did you, by the way, model those material science innovations using a software tool? Well, yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of innovation in the process control industry, chemistry, and, and, and drug research. I, I agree, there is. Did you manage your experiments with software? Did you analyze the data with visualization tools and data warehouses? Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. External collaboration is successful. IBM every year does a survey of 500 to 1,000 CEOs. And in 2007, the topic of the survey was global innovation. 500 plus of the world's top CEOs surveyed. Now, I can't get that kind of data. You probably can't get that data because we're not IBM and we're not paying a lot of money. But this is really important data. Now, look at what the survey says. The most significant sources of innovative ideas, and it says employees as number one. Hmm. You're thinking, oh, what does this mean? Employees are number one? Well, 
I'm actually getting that while the data is presented accurately here, it's presented in a misleading way. Because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take those bar charts and then I'm move them around a little bit. And I'm going to break it up to internal versus external. Cool? With me? What happens? Two to one. Two to one. External collaboration is considered to be essential for innovation by 500 of the world's top CEOs as surveyed by IBM. This is interesting. This is interesting. Bob Cooper, who studies new product development, says, do your homework, collaborate with customers, do spiral development. Yeah, you mean. IBM says, where's the source of external, or where's the source of innovative ideas? Go outside, the answers are outside. So how do we get there? Alice would suggest play. I think Alice was a smart guy. I'm gonna go with Alice. <laughs> so, let's find out who you talk with. Dennis, you're, you missed the shout out. Dennis is another training facilitator. For my training facilitators, we can help them get started with a spider web. We're gonna do a game called spider web. There's paper and crayons around you, or pens and pencils. What I want you to do is draw a circle in the middle of the paper. Write your name in the center of that circle. I want you to write the names of the people that you collaborate with at work on a regular basis. And I want you to draw lines between your name and their name. And I want you to draw, draw those lines in any way you want to represent the relationship that you have with that person. If it's a good, happy relationship, pick a good, happy color. If it's a not so good relationship where it's contentious, put a contentious color. Go draw, you have about three, four minutes we're going to be walking around and helping and answering questions. By the way, this will, uh, this will work better if you draw as it is, not as you wish it were. As it is, not as you wish it were. And don't, and try not to cry. I got one guy back here who's laughing so hard, but I think he's crying. It's okay. All right, you, guys, uh, you got a point of view on that? You got a point of view on that? Wrong once for yes, twice for no. Help me out. We're still working, I know, I know. So, we, uh, I'll, I'll tell you another version of this game that we did with some customers. Now, I want you to take a second sheet of paper, a second sheet of paper, because this is the names, right? And names, names are not something that we can share, but I'd be interested in seeing the results. And Dale, raise your hand. Dale's one of my training facilitators. He's gonna help me, he's gonna help collect results. Um, do it again, but this time, I want you to replace the name with the role that the person is playing. You know, developer or tester, if you still have differentiated roles in your agile team, that would be interesting, but you might, right? Look at that interaction. I think, uh, I think we're close enough. Now, this is a game that we play called Spiderweb. Now, normally, when we're playing this game, we're asking uh, customers of our client to draw pictures of system relationships or other relationships that are of interest. We do this collaboratively. Here you're doing it in a less collaborative form to illustrate a point. Now, when you look at your paper, I get to do the Dr. Phil. How's that working for you? Are you talking to interesting people? And more importantly, are you talking in a way that suggests that you are in fact engaging in customer collaboration? Are you talking with people outside your building or inside your building? Are you really, truly, regularly talking with your customers? Now, um, Dale, raise your hand. If you would like to see what other people wrote and you want to hand us the version of this that doesn't have individual names but roles, hand it to Dale and we'll take photos of it and we'll post it on our website. We'll see what happens and emerges. I'm going to show you some pictures and I hope they come through about other people done this exercise. So keep in mind that we're agilists, right? Because we're agile roots. Right? So we favor customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We do, right? All right. So developer one. Interesting. Um, they have developer, developer, engineer, management, marketing. Marketing, it, that's a big red line, it, it's not coming through. Red, equal, miscommunication. 
Green, good, not productive, clear, green to another developer. Right, blue, directly understood, right, jagged, to be avoided if possible. <laughs> now, did you see the customers in that picture? And how about your picture? Let's try it again. Developer two, happy, tense, problems. The closest this person gets is product management. But of course, product management isn't a customer. They're just a customer proxy. Sometimes they're good at customer proxies, and sometimes they're just frustrated ex-engineers who want to build what they want to build. And now they have the power to back up. It's not command and control, I'm just prioritizing it. <laughs> Think about it. Manager one, do this with a manager, and look what happened. Wait a minute. Developers were not talking with customers, but who gets to talk with customers? Managers, right? I'm a manager. I talk with partner, customer, partner, partner, customer. Interesting. So if we're so agile, where are all the collaborating customers? They're pesky. <laughs> You'll have to tell me why you're shaking your head. This is how you gotta find out. If we're so agile, we got a guy in the middle of the road going. If we're so agile, we're all collaborating customers. Well, we're gonna talk about that. Now, that's one big asterisk. Is it not? Yes. Yes, it is. So, hold on that point, I'm gonna come back to that slide. I think that one of the reasons that we may not have this notion of customer collaboration is because our tribe of agilists has equated many times collaboration to talking, collaboration to interviewing, tell me what you want, write a user story with me, which is effectively telling me what you want, it's a survey, right? So it's like you're talking to the pig, okay? And the pig's like, no, stop being pig. What do you want? This isn't collaboration. This really isn't collaboration. Now, think about our tribe. We've said write better tests, do better stuff, and we've created a whole infrastructure of testing, and, and a guy I trust, again, Dale, he's like, dude, have you seen this new book on agile testing and test driven It's rocks. I'm like, yes, we have books on something. But well, where's the stuff about collaboration? Where, where have you been taught how to really collaborate? And it's an, important to understand that collaboration is not, it's just it's more than talking. So what is it? Well, let's steal from Wikipedia, right? Because when you're doing talks, you can either steal images online and some of them copyrighted right away, go to Flickr or borrow Wikipedia. I thought Wikipedia was good. Sure. Bless you. So collaboration, it's recursion, which always you like because I'm an ex whisper. It's recursive. But it's about a goal, and it's the intersection of working together with these common goals, right? And so we share. This is collaboration. So the question is, how do we do this with customers? How do we teach ourselves and our community and our world to do collaboration? And collaboration is hot, 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 hot. I'm from Silicon Valley, right? Which is like the land of $80 billion of uninvested venture capital within 15 miles of my house. And they are shoveling money at social networking, social gaming, and collaboration. It's hot. It's hot, hot, hot. And yet, most people get collaboration wrong because they think it's the platform and it's not the platform. But we do need tools. We do need tools to platform. But collaboration isn't the platform. And when you log into a lot of these management tools, it's like you log in and here's your task board, here's your task list, and it's about you. Well, I thought collaboration was about working with others. And yet, I am important in the role of collaboration. My tasks are important if I'm going to work on a task board or in a collaborative way. How do I manage this? And it's not sharing, right? Especially in business, people are like, hey, we're going to share. It's like, you know, liquor. Well, kind of, but not really. Sharing isn't collaborating. Sharing is sharing. That's OK. Sharing is part of collaboration, but it isn't collaboration. And it's not notifications. There's a big, hot movement right now. How do I notify you? How do I signal you? How do I create the right Kanban board so that you can organize your work and we can do signaling mechanisms between the different functions? This is good, but it's not collaboration. And yet, we do need to be notified. And the other thing that's, I think, really interesting is that there's this notion of transparency in Agile in the sense that everything's got to be transparent. 
But guess what? That's not how humans work. We can't work where everything is always transparent. People need an opportunity to have private spaces, semi-private spaces, to engage in negotiation, to engage in collaborative acts. So how do we do this? Maybe it is the tools. Maybe we don't have the right tools for collaboration. We can talk about what kinds of tools exist for collaboration. Alistair's been distributing some tools for collaboration at the conference. Right? There are lots of tools for collaboration. So let's talk about what, if, if, if it's not the platform, but tools are important. And it's not sharing, but sharing is part of collaboration. What, what is this thing? Okay. Well, collaboration does need tools. In the land of computer-supported cooperative work, we organize the activities of people in the same time, different time, same place, different place. And we have different mechanisms, right? We have in-person games for, for what we do. We have online games. This is the same game done in person and online because the context will determine one or the other. We have co-located teams and we have distributed teams in terms of how people work. Now, innovation games, what we do, are serious collaboration tools. And what's, you know, it's kind of fun. Um, my old company was Enthiosis, the new one's the Innovation Games Company, partly because Enthiosis is hard to speak and read and spell. Um, but this is a Forrester report where they're talking about, wait a minute, there's something happening in the industry that says gaming and serious games are really important. Something's happening. So what are these things called innovation games? They're serious games. These are games that are played to solve complex organizational problems. And Andrew made a shout out in my introduction of some of our clients. We're very really proud of some of these clients, right? We've done some really interesting work for some of these people. We're going to talk about it. They're, now, these games are not silly games, like a water park, although people have fun. And they're not humorous games. So we're trying to distinguish this notion of a serious game or collaborative play from something like, you know, going to the water park or, or you know, going on steam and doing something, you know, like uh, pay, playing paintball with your team or something. It's more like Stuttlers of Catan, which is a game where collaboration matters and how you play matters. There's an element of competition, but there's an element of uh, collaboration. Or Euchre. Now, does anyone other than me want to know Euchre? All right. Euchre is a really fun card game, usually played with beer. Because I'm, I spent a lot of time in the Midwest, and I do have a beer for you. Y'all come over. Oh yeah, they can get a beer from the beer in the garage. And it's this notion of competition and collaboration. Now, one of the reasons that we struggle as an industry to talk about this notion of serious game or serious play is that we do not have a word for this in language. And if you understand linguistics, you understand that language structure is thought. And it's really hard to understand something that we don't have good words for. Because it's always oxymoron, right? Serious game. Huh? Serious play. Well, how can that be? So I'm going to give you a dimension that says, these are the things that you might find pleasurable, and these are the things that you might find not pleasurable. We'll call the things that you find pleasurable play, and the things that you find not pleasurable not to play. So far, it's good. And then over here, we're going to put not work, which is leisure. And what I mean by not work is you're not paid to do this. You choose to do this, or you're coerced to do this, as we'll see in a minute. And then we'll put over here the things that you do, which are work related. You get paid to do them. Now, for me, and, and this picture is completely personal. Let me give you my version of this picture. For me, that's not me, but that's a picture that looks like me. I have this hedge of ivy on the side of my house. And it's the evil ivy that needs shaving about every six weeks. It's eight feet long, it's eight feet high, it's three feet wide. I do not find shaving the ivy a pleasurable activity. To me, this is work. Now, I have a friend, Sandra. Sandra's wonderful, and she is a gardener who loves spending time in her garden. Her idea of a happy weekend is wake up Saturday morning and come home, you know, go at night, dirty with dirt, and making her garden beautiful. That's not my idea of where things go. Right. Are you with me? You can start to see this. Now, for me, I actually do like playing euchre. I think it's a fun game. It's quick. It's simple. It's just, you know, it's a good game to play. So I would put euchre up here. Now, at work, 
I run a small business. This is a picture of QuickBooks Accounting. I don't <coughs> find running my books pleasurable. An accountant, however, might. It's not, what, it's not my cup of tea, but for an accountant or a tax attorney or something like that, doing that kind of work would be fun. Of course, I find playing games useful. And you can look at this world, and, and the, the challenge is, we're happiest as humans when we are operating in that space. And if you look at that article, you'll find that part of this is that this guy has done brain scans between two eight-year-olds building a Lego city and two adults <laughs> collaborating, pairing in PowerPoint, and the brain scans are the same. The level of pleasure, the level of engagement, and the level of thought is the same. Makes sense. They're working in a pleasurable way towards a common goal. They're truly collaborating. So, and it is fun. So one of my clients is version one. Version one came to us and said, we've got some uh, part of our backlog that we would like to prioritize with our customers. We played three different games. These are the actual unedited transcripts from three games. You know, where I just said, did you enjoy the experience? Yes, it was fun. Now, when was the last time that your customers thanked you for giving them a survey? Maybe not. So what happens is it's not only that your team has a better response, your customers <coughs> will engage in this process. And this notion of collaborative play starts to affect people in really profound ways. Now, when you look at the world of collaboration, the definition talks about having a goal. Now, these are some of our client projects. And if you start to look at the goals, right? I want to prioritize the project portfolio. I'm on investment. I want to do new product development. This was a really interesting product, uh, project between NetApp and SAP. NetApp came to us and said, we're finding our software is used in interesting ways with SAP software. And I said, great, SAP is a customer. How about we bring SAP in the room in terms of the research since the project affects both companies? A little bit of shuttle diplomacy, but both companies agree to do a joint research project. So when you think about collaboration, and you start talking about extending your notion of collaboration to your customers, include the people in your ecosystem, your partners and suppliers. You, you know, start to think about who am I collaborating with to make something happen. Now we did a game with these people on SpiderWeb. We had webs, now we did an extremely abbreviated version. Most of the time the games take two hours for a single game with customers. With the game here, we had the, a, a, a spider web. One spider web, we had six spider webs drawn by customers, but just one of those spider webs was eight feet long and six feet high, showing all of the relationships and interconnections of a complex IT environment. Amazing stuff. And you can use that to do what someone shouted out earlier, which is what is the foundation of innovative products? Understanding the market need. Requirements come after the understanding. Requirements shape your understanding. But understanding the market need is part of that first step towards true innovation. Now, enterprise goals, what's interesting is all of these goals are verbs. We want to do things like envision the future. We want to prioritize stuff. We want to plan and sequence. We want to establish boundaries and understand relationships. These are part of the verbs. And this is where we start to see distinction between these kinds of games that I'm doing or games like Alistair is doing which if you look at traditional tools, chat is good, but chat isn't a sufficiently high enough application to help you collaborate with customers. Because it's not tuned towards the goal. It's like using a hammer to screw boards together. It's the wrong tool. It's not a sufficiently advanced tool. So what we're really trying to do is create a set of higher level tools that enable you to collaborate with customers. Now, verbs mean action, right? Verbs mean action. Now, I'm a Marvel guy, but I know there are DC people in the world, so I thought I'd throw in some DC stuff. Right, verbs mean action. And to take action, we need to both create the goal that enables the action, and then we need to reduce ambiguity so we know what we're building, reduce equivocality so that we can under, thank you. <laughs> reduce equivocality so that we have a high degree of confidence that the team is operating as a team and then we can do the normal stuff, which Agile helps with, which is identify, distribute, perform, integrate, and verify that the work is done. So collaborative play 
helps with these things, and Agile kicks in and does those things efficiently. Right? So these things are not antagonistic, they're very supportive of each other. Very supportive. Now, I mentioned you want to solve specific problems with specific tools. James Bond would be horrified if he fired up the blender. He would, because he asked for it shaking, not spinning, and certainly not blenderized. So, here are some examples of the games that we have. All of the games are at innovationgames.com. If you want to give me 83 cents, you can buy my book. My kids, thank you. I thank you. Right? So we have product box, which sets a vision. We have remember the future, understanding the shared success. We have Spiderwood, which you play, which helps you understand complex relationships. We have Start Your Day. One of the things that people make mistakes on in requirements gathering is they ask people, tell me how you need this done. And they forget that the relationship that you have to a product or service changes is over time. The way you use TurboTax in September is very different than the way you use TurboTax in March or April. The way that an amusement park needs to manage its database of customers is radically different in September than it is in May, right? And what we want to do is we want to give customers that we're working with an identification of need, an opportunity to tell us how the when changes the how. Because those things will change. We want to understand hidden needs and problems. There's a game called Show and Tell. There's another game, Speedboat. Help me understand things that are going wrong. If you want to, if you want to break Speedboat down, if you're a developer and you're like, look, look, I understand. I'm a developer. I really need, a, you know, developer centric. You can use Speedboat to identify technical debt. There's a blog post at innovationgames.com that explains how to do it. So you can you can leverage these things in teams that are internal. There are three games towards prioritization because prioritization is such a hard problem. You can prioritize benefits. You can build great roadmaps or you can use buy a feature. Buy a feature I'm not going to talk about except to say <coughs> one of the fun parts about buy a feature is when you get uh, customers to create their own money, it really personalizes it. These are Scott Bucks. Scott Bucks from Intuit. You see Intuit? Right? And, and at the top it says, the life of design we trust, innovate we must. Scott Bucks. And they use Scott Bucks when they're playing by feature. Now, why is road mapping important in the agile community? And I'm trying to try to bring this, bring this home. Let's try and make this sense. Why is it so important? Now, you can change these numbers, right? You can change these numbers. I chose what I thought was reasonably fair. A fully loaded developer being salary plus benefits, plus office space, plus gear. You can raise or lower that number, but I picked 150. Right? It's a little low for Silicon Valley, a little high for other places. Let's say that your iteration length is three weeks. Fair enough? Y'all do three weeks, two weeks, four weeks? One week? One hour? Continues. So if you, if you look at it, that means that your iteration cost, every three weeks you're, you're paying you know, 8,500 bucks, a little bit more. Your team size is eight, because it's a nice, complicated team size. That means that your iteration is costing you 69K. Let's say that you pull down 60 points because you're doing planning poker and points-based estimates. We know these aren't transferable or comparable. However, they are a way to understand what things cost. And this is an epic, and epics are really big things, really big stories. Our experience is that epics break down into as many as 20 to 50 discrete stories. The big chunk of work breaks down into all this other stuff because we're doing lots of elaboration and making things smaller because, and, and this is one of the problems with Agile, right? Customers like big chunky work, developers like you, right? And it's this dichotomy of customers want these big things and, and Agile people want these small things that is this notion of decomposition. Nonetheless, let's say that your average big chunk of work costs you 150K. Now, I don't know about y'all, but you can't be making a lot of mistakes at 150K and be successful in business. And so there's some worthwhile, you know, some goals to understand what's going on here. Well, let's look at the Agile planning. Have you, have you seen this, the Agile planning circle? Do you call it the Agile planning onion? Have you heard it called the onion? No? Yeah? I don't like calling it the onion because onions make you cry when you cut it. I call it the flame because Agile burns hot. 
name was Frank. So you have to manage the questions and the perspectives according to the time frame. And roadmaps really kick in at many months to many years as opposed to these other things. And you can start to see the overlap with the different organization structures that we work with. Now, do roadmaps look like that? Anyone see roadmaps look like that? Marketing comparison? <laughs> you got a witness? Yeah. Or they look like this, which is in some ways worse. This is pulled off the website. It's a really good marketing image that says nothing. Look at it. What does it say? Nothing. <laughs> Pretty wild. They're going to fix stuff. They're going to prove stuff and fix stuff. Now, this is an actual uh, client roadmap from one of our projects. And you can see it's messy. Because predicting the future is messy. So here you can see like there's a question mark, I don't know what's gonna happen. This could go here or here, and some stuff, right? So how do we create this? How do we get there in a collaborative way? Many of you have probably sat in an experience with customers where you bring in customers into the room, maybe at like a customer advisory board or a user group meeting, and your marketing team presents the roadmap in PowerPoint. Have you seen that? Right? And you're like, what do you think? And your customers are sitting there going, well, clearly they don't really want to know what I think because they gave it to be in PowerPoint. Because PowerPoint is not a medium for collaboration, it's a medium for presentation. <coughs> and that's not to, I'm not living on PowerPoint here. Because PowerPoint is fine, I'm using it right now. What I'm saying is that if your goal is to collaborate with customers, that medium is not the right medium. And, and what's interesting is there's this really interesting gap. You really do want to collaborate with your customers. You really do want to get their feedback on your roadmap. And they want to give it to you. And yet the tool doesn't allow for that. So let's, let's drill into this just a little bit. Does your roadmap look like this? These are actual pictures of, from the product tree in action, where we are representing, and it's kind of hard to see, it's a little faded, but these are actual trees where the features of the features of the emergent software product, the elements of the roadmap, are represented as apples and leaves in the future. When I say apples and leaves, I really do mean go to a school teacher supply store and spend four bucks and buy apples. Put a piece 